Excited to have him here tonight to share his heart and the word with us and a football. I'm, I'm done playing or talking about the Giants, by the way. You won't hear another word about I don't know if they did or not, but it's, it's bad. You know, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting to challenge speaking at Big House. An, it is an interesting challenge speaking at Big House. Uh, the reason it's an interesting challenge speaking at Big House is because Holy Spirit does a really good job preaching all on his own. He doesn't even need a present presentation. He doesn't need anything. Oh, actually, I wanted to read. I just want to read to you guys what I heard today. I'm sure you heard different things. All my fountains are in you. I'm not afraid to move and I'll follow you. Greater works than these shall we do. In every sound we make, be glorified. In everything, everyone who is born of the Spirit is blown by the wind. No more compromised sound. I will have my sound go out to this world. Bless the sound that is here. Let us become more aware of your presence. I want to become more like the Father. I want to walk like you. I want to talk like you. I want to sing like you. Dance with me. O oh, lover of my soul, I am home right now. The Lord wants us to be secure dancing with Him, safe in His presence. Can you be a little boy or girl again? You are His child. You are His child. And then that melody came forth. And then another word, you are a child. Just live it. You are His ambassador. This melody you sing. What are we supposed to be doing? He just wants someone to hang with. We overcomplicate things. The kingdom of God is at hand, and He does the rest. It's as simple as, learn, as leaning in the everlasting arms, safe and secure from all alarms. And then the Father speaks, I want to unlock the potential in you. I've sown my seeds in you. This is a season of singing, and I'm singing my song over you. And then the response, so I say to my soul, I will bless. Fill this world with the sound of your voice to your bride. Sing your song in us. Let the vibration of your voice shake what needs to be shaken so that only your sound resonates. That we may be recaptivated by how beautiful he is. Rain on the soil of our soul, softening the hard places, addicted to his presence. Soak the hard places of our hearts. Psalm 72, may he come down like rain on mown grass. And that we would be liberated in our need and in our holy desperation. And then the foolish Gumby anointing. We are free to be foolish. Imagine that, we're free to be foolish. Rejuvenate the child in our hearts. That silly, happy, trusting little child. Bring that child into the now. Pull that joy into the now. Kind of hard to follow that. You can sit down. I can sit down, but I am not going to. So uh, the football's here, and we're going to be here a little while because I promised myself that I won't rush through this because I think what I have to share is, is going to be interesting to you. I think you'll hear some things about life that you've never heard before. Maybe you may hear some things about Jesus that may challenge you, or at least my perspective. Uh, if you remember last week, Randall Worley said that, you know, he, the moment he walks with Jesus, he has more questions. So you may have a few questions from this. But we will talk about football today. Yay! At least a little bit. We will talk about football. But you will not miss Sunday night football. I won't be here that long that you'll miss Sunday night football, okay? Uh, but that reminds me, you guys have ever heard the song... Um, Carrie Underwood now sings the Sunday Night Football song. Are there any football fans in the room? Anyone? Yeah. We got a couple. Okay, I guess you know when you have when you have foot, when you have church during football, maybe you get fewer football fans. on But I'm a big football fan, so uh, uh, my daughter and I read it the words. So I'm gonna be foolish to that song. Okay, I'm not gonna sing it, but I'm gonna speak them. Okay, so you have to imagine Carrie Underwood singing this. Okay, all right, Sunday night. 
Where are you? Waiting for the church that always brings something new. You want some Jesus? We want him too. Hey, Jack, it's a fact. God's back in town. The preachers and the prophets are about to throw down. Big house is rocking. Time to crank up the sound. The faithful in Christ have come to pray. Coast to coast, there's just one thing left to say. I've been waiting all day for Sunday night. Yeah. Get on your feet for Jesus' might. Singing to God because He is right. Because I've been waiting all day for Sunday night. Sunday night worship at BHC. That's us. Yeah. Sunday night worship at BHC. Adam and Ryan are playing it sweet. The Spirit's here. It's the place to be. Because worship rocks at BHC. So, we're going to have some fun. We'll talk a little football. Uh, and we'll find out why these monkeys are up on the screen. And they're saying, why are they saying, they, can they handle part three? A while ago, I, I did uh, a message called Kingdom Improv. And I'm not going to go over that whole thing again. But the, the thesis was, living in Jesus' kingdom is like an improv. Un unplanned events are taking place all around us, requiring quick responses that add to the Holy Spirit's unfolding story. And we looked at, you know, how Jesus said, repent for the kingdom is at hand. And then we talked about this incredible connection that our hands have to the world and how our hands are our bridge to the world. We, sh we shake hands. All these things we do through our hands to connect ourselves to the world and that the kingdom is literally at hand. It's the kingdom's an extension of our own hands. You've, you've heard that tonight again. Uh, and then part two was living the kingdom improv, and we looked at John 5. We're going to look at John 5 today and John 15 if you want to mark your iPads or whatever you have your Bible on. Uh, but we looked at living in the kingdom improv, and we talked about John 5, the story of Jesus healing uh, the paralytic. And we saw how he actually lived out an improv. He just he engaged the situation, and we went through the steps of that, and it was very interesting. And it kind of ended here with this place. Actually, it was at a place called Bethesda. And those, that word means house of mercy and grace or house of disgrace. And this place, Bethesda, was an intersection. We talked about how the kingdom unfolds in our lives at this intersection between <coughs> disgrace and mercy and grace. And that's where we live. At the supermarket, in our jobs, in our homes, wherever we go, there's this intersection that is happening around us if we'll take the time. To see it, there's an intersection between disgrace and grace. So part three, how can we actually see or learn to see the improv? So Father, we uh, thank you for speaking to us, for being so gracious and giving us the freedom to be foolish and to run after you like children. So I just ask that this time together, uh, as we look at your word, as we, as, we, uh, as we just look at some interesting things that you would continue to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. So how can we see? John 5, this is, the, this is kind of the conclusion of the story of Jesus uh, when he, after he heals the, the paralytic man. If you want to look at that, it says, Jesus says, he's explaining what just happened, basically. Okay? And he says, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son does in like manner. And you know, this, this I think is our struggle as we read scripture, as we read these passages. It sounds great for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to say that. Easy for him to say. Yeah, sure, the Son can do nothing himself, unless it's something he sees the Father doing. What the Father does, that's, 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 Jesus is saying it. I mean, come on. What about us? I mean, is he relating to us or is he just telling us what? The Son of God gets to do as special privilege. It's, it's a good question, isn't it? The next verse, John, there's a clue, I believe. John, the next verse says, John 5, 20. For the Father, Jesus is speaking, for the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Shows the Father exposes to the eyes of the Son. Exposes to the eyes of the Son. Now, that phrase, greater works, Jesus uses that later. Does it ring a bell? You heard me say it. And for many of you, you immediately thought, wait a minute. Jesus said he's going to the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. 
and greater works shall you do. So maybe there's a subtle message that this is not some, this is not some mysterious thing that the Son of God alone gets to do. Maybe there's a clue. Hey, the Son is doing greater works. And then he later says that we're going to do greater work. So maybe this is something that we can't actually relate to. Now, there was an important clue. And you heard it again tonight, a few weeks ago, here at Big House. There was a really strong word about the children. And then there was prayers and, and uh, just praying for them that there'd be a special unction and anointing on the children. And, uh, and then these words came forth. There's a revival of childlikeness in the house. So we can understand greater revelation of the kingdom. We don't want to miss the day of visitation because we were too grown up. And then you heard me read it. That was, was that not repeated today? Not necessarily verbatim, but pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. And it was very strong tonight, too. So there's a clue here that we're getting. The Father keeps speaking to us about being like children. Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So we have these passages. We come back to this verse here, John 5. 19 to 20. What does this mean? The son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. The father shows him all things. What is this mysterious thing that we're talking about? Now, pretend that's the dining room table at my mom's house. And we were sitting, this a couple years ago, we're sitting down to dinner with her. And my three oldest kids are gone. And we sit down just like that. What's wrong with that picture? Can you, besides my face. Can someone tell me what's quick? Can someone tell me what's wrong with that picture? Did you see what just happened? Did you watch closely? The table was set, so we all had a nice, comfortable amount of room. And my son was way too far from his father. So he picked up his plate and he moved it as close as he could possibly get to me. And he sat down. Now, as adults, we would evenly space out the table, wouldn't we? We'd make sure everyone had enough room. But as an eight-year-old, he doesn't think that way. He thinks, I want to be next to Daddy. So let's look at that verse with that in mind. You like that? <laughs> Sam can do nothing of himself. That's my son. Unless it's something he sees his Daddy doing. For whatever the daddy does, these things Sam does in like manner. See, that passage, that quote from Jesus, it, it's not a deep theological thing, although it's deep and theological to me. It's very personal. This is my life. It was just a couple weeks ago. I was in the backyard, and I just, we're all kind of in the backyard. I just had to walk in the garage. And... I hear these footsteps behind me. Uh, where are you going? He says to me, where are you going? <laughs> I said, I'm going to the garage. Where are you going? I'm going to the garage. Why are you going to the garage? Because you're going to the garage. I read that song to you at the beginning of the Sunday Night Football Big House Version. Because it was an exercise that my daughter, Lauren, and I did together today. And I have a passion for worship and singing songs and writing tons of songs. She wrote most of the lyrics, and every time I got stuck, she came up with something. So she's being like her daddy. Simple thing. This happens over and over and over again. See, these, these, these passages are very practical, aren't they? When you think of it that way. There we go. And if you remember Randall Worley last week, he used this expression, keep me as the apple of your eye. This is, this is David's heart crying out to the Father. That's Sam, I don't know, a year and a half or something. I don't know how old he was. Is he six months? I can't tell. <laughs> Moms know, don't they, Adam? Moms know all the kids are. We don't have any idea how they are. Uh, keep me as the apple as, as, uh, as a six or seven. As an apple of your eye. And Randall, she said, you know, you know what that means? Keep me as the little man in your eye. Because when you look at someone, you see a reflection of yourself in, in their eye. In their eye. So it's us saying, oh, Father, keep me as a little man in your eye. Look 
at me. Keep me. Don't look away. Isn't that a different thought? I mean, to have over your eyes, I just thought it was a cool expression. I checked him, and that's what that, that phrase actually means. Keep me as a little man in your eye. <laughs> It must be. I don't know. You can't handle it. Anyway. <laughs> so what we're talking about today is imitation. We're going to talk about imitation today. Okay, we're going to talk about imitation. And I'm going to introduce you to a gentleman by the name of Andrew Melzoff, who wrote a book called The Imitative Mind. has done a lot of studies on how our minds are trained, are not trained, are born to imitate. Okay? So I'm going to go through some of these, and just we'll just hopefully enjoy this as we go through it. And I'll try not to rush, because for some of you, this is the first time that you're hearing these concepts. And for me, I can speak through them real quickly, because I've been thinking about this for a long time. But here we go. Research shows that imitation begins from the womb. And here's one way we know that. French babies, the cry of a French baby, the tonal qualities of it, sounds different from the cry of a German baby or a Japanese baby at birth from an English baby. Now the only way that can be is that the child in the womb is hearing the voice of his or her mother and is already imitating that voice. Is that not stunning? There was a study, he did a study of 40 newborn babies, mean age 32 hours. Not 32 days or weeks or months. I don't know who lets their child be studied in 32 hours. But uh, good for them. I'm glad they did. The results show that humans, human newborns, imitate facial acts. Now here's a little study that he did. And there's uh, melts off at a younger age doing this. Two or three week olds imitated tongue protrusion, mouth opening, lip, lip protrusion, as well as simple finger movements. And I know you all thought you were just being crazy every time you feed a baby, you do what? <laughs> you open your mouth. And it's almost, for me, it's physically impossible to, to not open my mouth when I feed a baby. Now, I don't know if anyone else has that experience, but for me, do you know what I'm talking about? Here's another good study that he did. Okay. That is a, a uh, I don't know, maybe I don't know how 18 month old or so, I can't remember how old. Anyways, there was a light table. They put a light table in front of, in front of an adult. They, had, they held the baby there, and they, they had a, an adult sit there with a light table that was not lit in front. And they had the baby just watch to see what the adult was going to do. And so they had control groups. One time the adult did nothing. Okay? But only if the adult put his head, his forehead, banged it, basically put it down to the light table, a very unnatural movement. Would the light table light up? That's the only thing you could bang with your hand. Nothing else you do. Only if the adult put his head on forehead to the light table would the light table light up. Okay, so they had control groups. Some of the adult didn't do anything. Some of the adult would do exactly that. 67% of the infants who were shown the behavior mimicked it one week later without prompting. As compared to 0% of the control group that was not shown. That's a week. They remember and they mimic, mimic this. Humans mimic accents, tone of voice, pauses, rate of speech, postures, mannerisms, moves, emotions. Research confirms that mimicry even promotes pro-social behavior. In other words, the one being mimicked, me, with my son following me into the garage. And he has no idea why. I actually receive many social benefits from that process. It's actually edifying even to the person who's being mimicked. So it's kind of like the monkeys are back. Monkey see, monkey do, except for one small problem. Monkey imitation is hard to come by in controlled experiments. Belying the common wisdom of monkey see, monkey do. Monkeys don't do this. <laughs> Humans do this. 
We do this. We're hardwired for it. And if you remember nothing else, and this is a complex kind of a quote, but if you remember nothing else, try to remember this. Perception and production speak the same language. There's no need for associating the two through prolonged learning because they are intimately bound at birth. What does that mean? When you perceive something, you do it. That was what Mr. Worley was talking about last week. When he was talking about the spirit of adoption and that we just are his sons and daughters. And if we will perceive it instead of laboring and striving like we do so well as Christians, don't we, don't we labor and strive really well? If we will perceive our sonship, production will follow. We will naturally start acting like sons and daughters instead of striving to be a good whatever. Perception and production speak the same language. Here's some quotes. This is, this is not like new thoughts. This has been around for a while. What I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, I understand. Aristotle. Imitation is natural to man from childhood. He is the most imitative creature in the world and learns first by imitation. Thomas Jefferson. Man is an imitative animal. This quality is the germ of all education in him. From his cradle to his grave, he is learning to do what he sees others do. Albert Einstein, a little bit of a smart guy. All true learning is experience. Everything else is information. Well, let me talk about something I learned about, about our brains. It's called mirror neurons. Has anyone ever heard of mirror neurons? Mirror neurons, very good. So the rest of you get to learn something. See, I told you you learned something today. Mirror neurons are a type of brain, there's the football. Mirror neurons are a type of brain cell that responds equally when we perform an action as when we witness someone else perform, perform the same action. Now, let me see if I can explain that to you. If I perform the action of throwing this football, which I may not do well, but I, I'm going to perform the action. Who would like to catch the football? Stand, you better stand there, I could go anyway. I'll come back, I get my shoulders, I get my shoulders square. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn you down. I'm going this way, it's a long throw. Whoa! How was that? How was that throw? See the spiral? You gotta get your shoulders, Oscar, right? Elbows out, shoulders square, come through elbow first. Down we go. When I perform that action, neurons in my brain are firing to enable me to perform that action. Specific neurons are firing. I don't know how many, lots of them. Okay? Now, Zhangi, throw the football. Can you do it? Don't hit it light, because then the new light would be really mad at us. So don't, do, don't hit those lights. Come on. Do it. Let's do it. Come on. Now, when Jean Guy threw the football, about 20% of the same neurons that fired in my brain when I threw the football also fired in my brain when he threw the football. So, my brain has a physical connection to what Jean Guy just did. Does that make sense? Isn't that fascinating? So it's not like, oh, I just saw it and I remember it. No, no, no. When he threw it, it was almost as if I threw it in my own brain. It's almost as if I threw it. Mirror neurons. The neural mechanism is involuntary and automatic. With it, we don't have to think about what other people are doing or feeling. We simply know. We're designed to be empathic, imitative creatures. We're designed for this. If you've ever wondered why men love ESPN, because when they're sitting there clicking the remote, 
and that guy's throwing the football. They are throwing the football. <laughs> they are actually, we are actually throwing the football. You have, you have to understand this. We're actually throwing the football. Did you know that ESPN is part of ABC, which is part of Disney Company? Did you guys know that? Did you know that half of Disney's profits are generated from ESPN? It's that big. It's that big of a deal. So ESPN literally has a hold on my mind because I love baseball and I love all these sports. And I didn't play organized football. I played enough football. I actually bought that football today. <laughs> I needed a football. I have, Sam's got some footballs, but they're like Nerf footballs and they're all in the pool and they were soaked. So I wanted a football. And um, Wes Brown was over our house and I pulled it out of the bag and you could just see his face. He's just like, football, football. Are you going to throw it? He's like a dog. Are you going to throw the football to me? Squirrel? Squirrel? Someone throw the football to me. Now see, doesn't that feel good, Adam, to have the football in your hands? It's just a good feeling, okay? It's about the blue chat. So, I promised you a little football, but before we do a little football, I need two volunteers. I need someone who will say, Steve, I don't like football. I don't watch football. I'm not interested in football. Who will say that? Oh, wait, 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 back here, back here, come on, come on. Are you coming forward to repent? What's your name? Benjamin. Benjamin, you don't like football. Do you watch football? No. At all? When I'm with my dad. Okay, but you don't like it. Okay, stand right here, Benjamin. I need someone who loves football. I need someone who has played football. I need someone who's played football at least in high school. Any, any, anyone left? I need someone who's played football in college. Oh, we have someone here. Oscar is here. Is he the only person who's played football in college? Anybody else? Okay, we've got, name again. Benjamin, I won't forget again. Oscar, come on up here. So we've got Benjamin, who doesn't like football. He's not interested in football. Then we've got Oscar, who's played... And, and what's your name again? Oscar. And you played football. What position did you play? I was an offensive guard. For what team? Uh, VMI. <laughs> Were you a starter? I was a starter. You're a starter. So you've played football. Yes. You feel football. Yes. I understand you watched a lot of football last night. I did. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now it's kind of hard to look into that light and see. So I want, I want Benjamin. I want you to look at that screen. And Oscar, you look at that screen. Make sure the volume is turned up, please. We got volume. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Like that commercial? Yeah, it was well shot. It's well shot. Did you have a deep emotional bond to it? Surprisingly, yeah. Did you really? Well, then it was an excellent commercial. Yes. Okay, good. Thanks, Benjamin. You, thanks for ruining my point. That's okay. <laughs> Actually, just goes to show you a great commercial. Now, Oscar, what did you feel inside of you when you watched that? Uh, back in playing the game again. It was as if you were there, right? 
Yeah, because you would have been like the offensive lineman in that play. Yeah, but uh, but I also coached, and so when I saw the defense moving around, I remember you know uh, blitzes and stunts and everybody pointing to pick up the play. Because right, you saw, I don't know if you guys saw the cornerback, cornerback, correct? Or came in for a blitz, right. and the quarterback said red, 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 and the running back went from this side to that side, right? right? And picked up the blitz. Pick up the blitz. So, did, did your heart race at all? Yeah. <laughs> Benjamin, thank you so much, Oscar, thanks. The point is, Oscar also coached, and he was also the guy in the sideline yelling in the play, and he was the offensive lineman in the middle of the play. Now, it is an excellent commercial, Benjamin. So you were, I mean, it's, it grabs you, doesn't it? It's a, it's a minute long commercial, and you know, they did the whole thing about measuring for the fourth down and short yarders. They went over the defense, they circled the offense. I think it was one camera shoot. How long did that take to, 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 to do? But my point is, Oscar, I could feel it a little. Benjamin could feel it. Oscar was in that play. Wow. He was in the play. We are hardwired to imitate. I've done a message so far without even, well, I had a couple of scriptures at the beginning. I didn't, I'll, I'll be all right, we'll get there. Okay. <laughs> Now here's my challenge. Perhaps that's why we have no recorded evidence of Jesus ever once saying, obey me. So please check me on this, challenge me, question me. Let's have lots of discussions about this. It's, it's, it's an interesting topic, but I'm gonna throw that out to you and let you go look, search out the scriptures, see what Jesus did say. Isn't that kind of challenging to even, even if I'm close to true, even if Jesus only said obey a couple times? He said go and sin no more. He said go and sin no more. I mean, I, I, listen, we may have, we have a great discussion whether I'm right or wrong or indifferent, but here's my point. You're not going to see the Greek word hupotasso, which means to array yourself under. You will not see Jesus say, obey me, in an array yourself under me way. Now, he did have commands and do lots of things. But they said, isn't it amazing that the winds and the waves hupatasso him? They have arrayed themselves under him. There's lots of those. But what did Jesus say? He said, follow me. And he said it like a bunch of times, or at least it's recorded a bunch of times in the Gospels. And what does follow me mean? If I can get this thing to... It means go in the same direction. Would you go in the same direction as me? Let's look at John 15. I am the vine, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. Abide to remain, to sojourn, to continue to be present. Oh, if I could just sing the songs that CJ was singing. That's what we were singing today, was it not? That I could be more aware of your presence, that I could hang out with you, instead of striving so much about what I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to win the loss and this and that, that I could hang out with you more. Abide in me and I in you. I am the branch. Now, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Isn't it amazing how many times the vine's going to show up here? And I made it blue. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, verse 5. You are the branches. He who abides, remains, sojourns, continues to be present in me and I in him. He bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't obey Jesus. You guys understand. I'm not saying that we should not obey Jesus. I'm just saying that he teaches us obedience a different way than we in the Western mind think of obedience. He teaches us by saying, remain, soldier, and continue. Hang out. Relax a little. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. For say, my Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. 
Verse 9, just as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide. Has he said it enough? Are we getting them? I mean, abide, abide, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, verse 10, you may have a translation that says, if you obey my, if, if you obey my commandments, okay? If you keep my commandments, if you attend to carefully and observe. The root is being a spectator. If you keep my commandments, if you look, Dad's going to the, going somewhere. I'm going to go with him. He's going that way. I, I got my eyes on him. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, keeping his commandments. You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. See, you're going to do it just like I've done it. It is possible. These things I have spoken to you so that, my, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Imitate me. So Jesus says, follow me. And then the writers of the letters use this word, mimetes. It's where we get the word mimic, literally. Mimic, mimic me. Be imitators. I put mimickers in there. Be imitators of God. Be mimickers or imitators of me as I also am of Christ. Mimic, imitate their faith. Imitation. If we want to make disciples or raise children or see the kingdom improv or have the childlike heart necessary to inherit the kingdom, we must understand our imitative mind. You know, this is kind of how we often think about how we can win the lost and get people saved. We think generally in this order, often, doctrinal confrontation. And, and I'm not saying this is all wrong. I'm just saying this is our paradigm. This is our general paradigm. Salvation. Then we call people to obedience. Then we invite them into deep relationships in the church. Generally in that order. And we and we were perplexed because we know people who don't know Jesus. And our thought is, I have to convince them that Jesus is true. Then I can start bringing them into this life. Because they're living all this, doing all this stuff that they're doing. And they're not going to, so i got to convince them. Then I can show them. And then we can bring them into our club kind of uh, thing. And Adam talked about it a few weeks ago. I don't know if you can see that. It's a model of believe. Behave, belong. Our focus is on getting people to believe and then teaching them how to behave so they can have a deep belonging place in our communities. It's kind of a general paradigm. Look at this one. And, and, and think of the 12 guys who followed him around at first. And they kind of followed this path encounter Jesus, experience. Follow Jesus. He says, follow me. What did they do? They started following him. They, they didn't know. Even to the very end of his time on earth, they still didn't know. They didn't get it. They thought he was going to set the kingdom here on earth. And he was like, Gosh, you guys still... Okay. Jesus said, okay. They'll get it eventually. The Holy Spirit will come and they'll, they'll get it then. Mimic Jesus. Habits. Disciple of Jesus. Lifestyle. Believe in Jesus. New birth, see and do, hear and act like Jesus, gifts, sense of mission and purpose, and little Christ is the goal. That's what Christian means. That we would literally be a reflection of his image in this world. Now, I put believe in Jesus number five, which may be a challenge in how we think. Now, it doesn't have to be number five, but this is the model of belong, believe, behave. We invite people into our lives. To follow us into the garage or at work or wherever it is. Just invite them into our lives. And this gives us an open door because they will see something's a little different about these people. What is it? And we can explain them what's different. And then they can then they will come to faith in Christ. And through that faith in Christ, there's a response to their faith in Christ, their behavior will change because perception and production speak the same language. So as their perception changes, the production happens. And we have to fight, fight people all the time to, to, to act a certain way. 
But believing can happen anyway. Look, you could come here today. And there was a real encounter with Jesus here. There is today. And there's an opportunity for you to say, you know what? I'm ready. Today is acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. So we call people to salvation anywhere on this continuum. Maybe they want to follow Jesus. You know, why don't we invite people to follow Jesus? Hey, why don't you find out about him? He's, you know, if we made a list of the smartest people who've ever walked the earth, he's got to be in the top something, top five, ten, if we just made a list of people. So why don't we invite people to find out about him? That's what following Jesus is. Just got to find out about him. Come to a group. Come hang out with me. Let's have lunch. Why don't you find out a little bit about him? You know, People will start mimicking Jesus. Maybe they'll believe then. A lot of the disciples didn't believe until they already were disciples. And they had been living with him for months and months and months. And I can make an argument that Jesus lived with the 12 disciples for about 18 months before he directly confronted him with a doctrinal question. He said, who do men say that I am? Well, they say this, da 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 Who do you say that I am? Peter said what? You are the Christ. You mean Jesus let him walk with him for 18 years before Peter said, you are the Christ? And even at that point, Jesus said, flesh and blood has not even revealed this to you. This is a revelation. Is not salvation a revelation, ultimately? So just offer that to you that the path can happen many different ways because we are imitative. And why don't we invite people into our lives and let them imitate us? Next thing you know, you have a guy standing up here with long hair down to here and beards. Well, they're not copying me. I'm not sure why, but they're not. Anyways, so that's, that's the path. You know, and that's, it's interesting because I, you know, Adam said that's, that's the culture of our community at Big House as we move into Ghent. This is the culture of our community. That we would pull people into our lives and say, hey, let's build a football. There's a game on tonight. Pull people into our lives and see perception and production to speak the same language in them. Uh, checking the time. We've got five minutes. So I, will, I will actually ask Jerry to tell the story at another time. But Big House Church is in existence because Jerry did this many years ago. Invited a young lady who did not know Christ, who was doing things which are not of knowing Christ, invited her to church. And she stayed in that community for six months and then finally gave her life to Christ. Then they later got married. So our church is literally birthed in this model. And we should have them just tell the story sometime and just take time to do that and hear that. I think it would be important. Uh, but Big House is birthed in, hey, come on, come hang out. You're cute. Come hang out here. That's probably what he said. I don't know. <laughs> come hang out here. Six months. And I, I do want to take, if you'll give me a couple more minutes, that is an image, a picture of um, this document. I came here, my wife and I, Stacey, I came here in 1990 to go to Regent University, and I had to fill out an application. I don't know if they still do this. It was my personal goal statement. I found it when we moved this spring in a box I was going to throw away. You know how that works. And I found it. And it's great. It's a great document in that it asks you all these questions that are amazing questions to read them like 100 years later, I guess it is now. Uh, it's almost exactly what I'm doing with my life today, which is an amazing thing. And I, and I want to encourage you guys, if you're not sure what you're doing with your life and you're struggling and can't figure it out, that's where I was. I had just gotten fired. We lived in Tulsa. I'd gotten fired from a job. And I had been unemployed for five or six months. And I was as depressed as I've ever been. I could not get out of bed. My wife went to work. 
She was a nurse working at the hospital, making sure we could pay the bills. I couldn't get a job at Burger King. I tried. And so I would stay in bed. And one of my friends would come and knock on my door until I'd get up. I was that depressed. And the friend said, hey, why don't you go back to school? OK. And I filled out an application. And I filled out a personal goal statement. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. But I do want to. Um, I want to read one, one section of it. It's page two. Page two. What do you view at this point as the greatest spiritual need in your life? 1990, I was 20, I don't know, four, five, 25. What do you view as the greatest spiritual need in your life? I believe I need to live among elders, men and women who have a secure and personal walk with the Lord which is not easily threatened by the ideas and ideals of an unpolished 25-year-old. I often express this in terms of a mentor experience, which is so common in days gone by. I'm currently seeking out, seeking out the advice of a certain select group of men and women who serve as a source of accountability for me. I endeavor to continue these relationships and foster new ones in the months to come. I had a great father. He was, he was still alive at the time. He died soon after that. But I... I had a great spiritual father legacy, and yet I knew inside of me that I needed elders. And you know, one of the great things about Big House is Big House is a generational church. I don't know if you've noticed it, that there's like a, a relationship which is central to the whole church, a father and a son. In, in a world where fathers and sons have been destroyed, where the, the enemy has literally destroyed the relationship of fathers and sons, and we see the devastation all around us. And we have a church built around a father and a son and a son, and mothers and grandmothers, but I'm saying there's something about a father-son relationship. Two of my elder fathers are in the room today. Joel's with us here at Big House, and Oscar's back from Oman for a few weeks. Somewhat coincidentally, I guess. Uh, we, I was gonna do this a few weeks ago, and he wasn't here. You know? I can tell you, I still need that. I'm, I'm, I want to be that here. And yet I still need it. It wasn't too long ago, Joel was grabbing the parking lot. And I, I was struggling. He just gave me a big bear hug. I wept in his arms. Mentor. I want to show you another face. Because Oscar was, is still one of my, my mentors. But he was mentored. It's generational. He was mentored by a man you probably don't know. He died a few years ago. Jack Birch. This is from his obituary. Jack Birch dedicated his life to mentoring others to become strong people of faith. Because of his commitment to Jesus Christ, many lives were changed and paths formed to become strong leaders in their communities. I heard the stories of Jack Birch sitting in church and talking to Oscar. I'm going to tell one of them on you, Oscar. If you guys give me a couple more minutes, I promise. I'm going to tell one of them. It's my favorite one. You probably know which one it is. Oscar had just found the love of his life, Becky. And Oscar was a pretty stubborn guy. He's a wonderful guy. But he was hardcore. Jesus is coming back. I don't need to buy an engagement ring. <laughs> so Jack and Oscar drive down the road. And Jack's kind of like, Jack was a business owner. Oscar became a business owner. I became a business owner. And the stuff, it's amazing. You imitate. Buy her the ring? Nah, no, I'm not buying the ring. Slams on the brakes. Pulls the car over. Pulls out his checkbook. Writes Oscar a check. Says, get the bleep out of my car and go buy her a ring. Leaves him on the side of the road. <laughs> We could go on and on and on. It's, it's. Did you get the ring, Oscar? Imitation. Simple questions. Who are you imitating? Who is imitating you? 
Simple questions. Well, Father, we're thankful that we can, that we are your children and we have the freedom to crawl up into your lap, to throw the football, to uh, sing a song, to dance. And Father, thank you for settling it in our hearts that we are your sons and your daughters. And we just want to look to you. We want to fix our eyes on you and follow you from the backyard to the garage, not even knowing necessarily what's in the garage or what's going on. We want to follow you. And in that following of you, Holy Spirit, that you would bring others along that would get just get caught up in this, that they would, they would want to follow you as well. wired us. You, you made our brain such that that we would imitate from, from the womb and that this is your plan. You have no other plan for reaching the world other than that we would follow you and that, that we would in turn call others to follow. That, that we would make disciples this way by inviting people into our lives. So, Holy Spirit, as we, as a community, get ready for a major move, that you would settle it in us, your pattern for reaching Ghent, for reaching our neighbors, for reaching this world.